The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and evening, everybody, and welcome to the Australasian Timber Flooring Association third technical webinar of the year, which is on effects of heating systems. My name is Joshua Fielding, and I'm the Membership and Events Manager with the ATFA, and I'll be your host for tonight. The ATFA Technical Manager, Mr. David Haywood, will be presenting the webinar for you shortly. So today's webinar, Effects on Heating System, is enthusiastically and proudly sponsored by Regipole. Regipole Soundproofing Underlays. The way Regipole treats soundproofing of floor space has a big impact on the well-beings of those that live in apartments. With heightened controls on acoustic amenity in apartments, it's now more important than ever to partner with a leading, leading and trusted brand. Regipole are more than just an acoustic underlay. You can rely on 30 years of industry knowledge and experience. For more information, please visit Regipole at regupol.com.au or phone them at 1800 418 909. So just on a few events that we have coming up with the ATFA over the next six weeks, guys, before we get into tonight's webinar. Firstly, to our WA members, we have the Perth Trade Night on next Wednesday, the 22nd of May at the Leaderville Function Centre at 246 Vincent Street, Leaderville. We've got a record number of exhibitors participating. We've got a guest speaker, Mr. Willie Rioli from the West Coast Eagles coming along. And we've got some fantastic cash prizes to give away on the, tri on the night to con contractors. So please make sure you get those registrations in and come along and have a great industry night and do some networking. To our Queensland members, on the 4th and 5th of June, we're running the ATFA Solid Timber Flooring Technical Work Techniques Workshop in Brisbane. This course is the practical component of solid timber floors, the ATFA industry standards. You'll be trained in site evaluation and the use of equipment and techniques essential for high quality outcomes. Contractors will benefit from working alongside skilled instructors and those in supervisory or technical roles will learn the practical aspects needed for more effective liaison between contractor and client. This is the only ATFA workshop, which is a practical hands-on training. The ATFA is subsidising the price. It's normally $895. Uh, we're subsidising down to $595. So registrations are open now, but be quick as this, there's only a couple of spots still remaining. To our Tasmanian members, on the 19th of June, we're running the How to Handle Complaints and Expectations workshop in Hobart. Uh, New South Wales members, on the 26th of June, we have the Problems Detection Solution Workshops. Spots are filling up quick on that one as well, guys, so please get in. And to our Victorian members, on the 16th and 17th of July, we have the most popular workshop with the ATFA, which is Assessing Timber Floors. I'm sure that one will fill up as well. So, guys, last thing before I pass you over to Dave is a reminder that entries are now open for the ATFA Floor of the Year Awards and Awards for Excellence. You can enter by going to the ATFA website. Floor of the Year entries and awards for excellence entry closes on the 10th of June, so it's only four weeks to go, guys. If you're not entering the awards this year, but still after a great night, the Hereford Hardwood Sponsored ATFA Awards Dinner will be held at the Park Height in Melbourne on Saturday, the 24th of August, and tickets for the dinner are on sale now on our website also. So to register or to find out some more information on the events I've just spoken about, please go to the ATFA website, which is atfa.com.au, or feel free to send me an email, josh at atfa.com.au. Okay, guys, I think everyone seems ready to go. So if you have any questions tonight um, for Dave regarding the webinar, please just type them through and we'll come back to it at the end of the um, webinar and go through them with Dave. So now everyone seems ready to go. Hope you enjoyed today's webinar. I'd like to introduce you to Mr. David Haywood to present Effects of Heating Systems, proudly sponsored by Regipole. Hello, Dave, you there? Yeah, I'm here, Josh. Uh, can you hear me okay? Sound great. Yep, all, to, all good to go. Okay, that's good. Okay, effective heating systems. And I suppose you're thinking, well, where's Dave? He's, he lives in, in Queensland. What would he know about heating systems? But um, I would like to, I suppose, inform you that while living in New Zealand, you said to live in a much colder climate with a wood-fired heater that uh, we used to put on for about five months of the year. So certainly I have lived in colder climates, um, and in that house we also had a timber floor as well. Um, You'll notice on this front page here, there's two information sheets. There is one, Effective Heating Systems on Timber Floors, which has got a lot of good information that can be handed out to, to uh, homeowners and that sort of thing to make them start thinking about some of the consequences of using uh, various heating systems and that sort of thing. And really tonight's presentation will, will um, deviate from some of the information that's in there. So it's got good information in there and um, what we'll talk about tonight will we'll, um, uh, add to that. Uh, Another information sheet, which I suppose is a little bit linked, is floors with underfloor heating. And we'll touch on some of the elements of uh, that as well. It's all part of um, heating systems and, and houses. So really tonight we're going to cover what's four, four different types of areas. We're going to uh, initially talk about heating, to have an understanding of the different types of heating. Um, the effect of the internal climate. I don't know whether you're aware, but different types of heating systems um, 
do affect the the climate inside the house or inside the room differently. Um, look at a couple of it on on heating types and their impacts that they can have on floors, and uh, a few tips to maintain a stable internal environment. Now, I suppose with the last one there, I think we're in uh, times nowadays where where things are changing quite a lot of what is expected from people and what what people will do, and we'll talk a little bit on that a little later on. Okay, um, when it comes to a type of heating, and I suppose we need to um, consider a couple of things here. Firstly, that a modern, well-insulated home um, often needs uh, little heating or much less heating than maybe houses that are that are that are old, and and so um, really the the heating that occurs is often a lot more controlled. Uh, you don't need so much of it, and so therefore um, creating this uh, pleasant internal environment is uh, uh, easier in some of our modern homes than it, than would occur in some of our older homes. But of course, we've also got older homes that are getting uh, done up with uh, new floors and that sort of thing, and they may not be um, as well insulated. Now, there's three ways of transferring heat. Um, there's radiant heat, and this is uh, heat's people and objects with direct uh, radiation. So on the left hand side there, two examples of this is the uh, little wall type heater which can be turned on and you stand in front of it and say, oh that's great, that feels warm, or typically a, a gas radiator or a great gas heater as in the photo beneath that. So that's radiant heat, stuff that you can feel directly uh, coming towards you. Then there's also convection heat, and this is where um, uh, warm air or air is um, heated and that air is then uh, circulated and so a couple of options for this type of heater or convection type heaters is one the little fan uh, type one with some sort of heating uh, element or, or method inside that or the, um, the the hot oil type heaters which the, the air just comes across and wafts across and uh, creates warm air from that. And then the, uh, the third way of heating is conduction, and this is heating a surface uh, for direct contact. And so where we have underfloor heating, uh, we walk on the flooring and oh, that flooring's nice and warm and uh, that's conduction. So there we have it. We've got three different main different types of uh, heat and we have heaters or heating systems that fit into uh, each of those. Okay, now let's have a look at some of the different effects of these heating systems. On the left-hand side there up the top, uh, I've got a wood-fired heater, one that I knew, um, uh, knew, knew very well in my uh, days uh, with a young family in New Zealand and, and Rotorua, we had a, a wood-fired heater there. And I used to be quite proud of myself in that, uh, you know, if you crank the thing up, I could maintain a, a 20 degree difference between outside and inside. And so when it was minus four outside, well, that was only 16 degrees inside, but it still felt felt warm. Um, and of course, with these, everybody likes to see the flame. And of course, when you can see the flame, well, you're getting direct radiant heat uh, coming out through the door, and that radiant heat will also uh, impinge on the floor. But also, the way these heaters work, you've also got um, sort of panels on the side, ceramic panels which heat up, you've got the flue that's going out through the uh, through the roof, uh, and so therefore we're getting uh, heat uh, coming off those, in which case we get uh, convection type uh, type heat from, from that. Now, interestingly enough, I suppose not all um, heating systems will dry out the air, um, and we'll talk about how it dries out the air soon. And I suppose the, the, the one exception or the big exception is an unflued gas heater, so that uh, heater down the bottom there. And when we say unflued, it means we're just burning gas and uh, that yes, it's providing radiant heat, uh, which we can feel, but the process of burning also creates uh, water and so it's adding moisture into the air. Now, I'm not really sure how, how long um, 
these will be uh, uh, in service for because the various parts around the world and various countries are saying, hey, they're not such a good idea because we've got other things in the in, in the gases that are coming from the heater, which may not be uh, good for us. So you could say they're a little bit controversial. Now, if we move over to the diagram on the right, I think there's this is sort of two interesting things. The first one shows underfloor heating. So um, uh, when we look at that and look at that graph, we see the temperature profile from floor level to ceiling level. Uh, it shows that, yes, it's hotter down at floor level, ah, moderate at head height, and cooler up the top. So it's although hot air rises, um, there is a temperature profile that is uh, more that way inclined. Whereas if we've got a radiator, maybe a wall radiator, um, and it might have a fan in it, well, what this tends to do is uh, push warm air up to the up to the uh, ceiling, and it will tend to circulate round and cool down, and come back through the heater and be circulated again. So this sort of has the opposite effect. It has um, it's cooler um, at the uh, at floor level and hotter at um, ceiling level. And certainly when with the wood fired heater that I uh, that we used to have, you used, sometimes you'd be sitting on the couch and you'd stand up, oh, that's warm where my head is, in which case all the heat had accumulated, or a lot of heat had accumulated at the top. And of course, once we have uh, fans in rooms um, that are circulating air, and of course ceiling fans often have two directions on them, you can either uh, blow the air down in summer, or you can suck the air up in winter to circulate it, and you're going to get much more even temperature distribution in your room from that. So I think what's important from this is that, that different heating systems uh, are going to provide different temperatures at floor level. Okay, when it comes to, um, you know, within these categories, if we look at um, uh, underfloor heating, look on the internet, oh man, there's all different sorts of, lots of different types of heating systems that are out there. And I suppose the one that we, we are probably more familiar with in, in some ways is the hydronic heating, where you've got uh, pipes that are set into your slab or maybe set into a screed, and we put... Uh, hot water through that, that heats the slab, the slab then heats the flooring, and the flooring then um, heats us or provides a pleasant environment for us to be in. Um, so often we like to, to stand on something that's warm rather than something that's cold. Um, but you know, there's lots of different other types around too, and in the centre there I've only put, uh, I suppose, one option or a different type of option which shows a, a floor on joists with a aluminium plates going between the joists and inside those uh, two heating coils, so our heating tubes. The heating tubes uh, obviously transfer the heat to the aluminium, the aluminium then to the floor surface. Now, um, just, a, just a word on this is that we also need to remember that companies that make heating systems don't usually make timber flooring. And I think you'll have um, uh, you know, some conjecture out there of, of um, the effects of some heating systems that might be out there and say, hey, these are fine for timber floors, but uh, I know some companies are saying, well, we'll only, uh, we'll only have our timber floors over hydronic heating rather than um, other forms of heating. So again, if you're, you're purchasing product and it's going down onto a, um, uh, a subfloor heating system or an underfloor heating system, you need to be careful that the product itself is going to be suitable for it. And we'll talk about this a, a little bit later, but part of the suitability is also uh, not only the product type, but the species on it as well. And I know some companies say, yes, you can use this, this uh, flooring product, but not that one. But there's lots of other uh, bits and pieces around, and you'll see on the right hand side there, here's, a, here's another system. We've got electric cables for um, a floated type floor um, or an adhesive fix type floor. Um, in this case, it's showing the, the, uh, the floated floor with, a, with an underlay and the flooring above that. Um, and again, with this sort of thing, you need to be careful that the uh, product that you're laying over the top of such things, or owners need to be aware that not all products are suitable uh, um, for underfloor heating. So lots of options out there. 
Now, I suppose the, the next question that might come along is, is quite simply, well, what's a comfortable internal environment? What's a comfortable internal climate? So I picked up on three views here, um, uh, just off different websites, but um, and not necessarily to do with timber floors, some of them to do with general um, health within the dwelling. Um, often we hear things like, um, uh, you know, um, the building building health and uh, what's uh, suitable inside a health so that we don't get other other problems. Obviously things like mould and, um, and those sorts of things uh, are often on people's minds as well. So there's quite a lot of information about um, what are comfortable internal climates that, that isn't necessarily written by uh, flooring type people. And if we jump across the Tasman, um, let's have a look at, look at that. Now, when we jump across the Tasman, um, yeah, my general feeling after coming to Australia is that New Zealand has, you know, generally quite a quite a cold, what we would regard as quite a cold climate and a high humidity climate. And it says here that indoor relative humidities are generally lower than outdoor relative humidities. Now that's the same and same over here too. Generally, our humidity inside our house is less than outside. Um, in New Zealand dwellings, and ranging from 30 to 65 percent during the daytime in a dry house, and 50 to 75 percent in a damp house. So it's interesting here. We've got this this differentiation between what they were regarding as a dry house and uh, a damp house. Now I don't know whether that would be. You could think a dry house might be a newer house on slab and that sort of thing, better insulation and those sorts of things. But 50 to 50 to 75 percent is, is really quite high. Um, cold uh, bedrooms can have. Uh, relative humidities from 80 to 90% at night. So I remember when I was a kid growing up that um, yes, we heat the lounge and that sort of thing, but when you went into your bedroom, you had all sorts of dunas and things on top to try and keep you warm. So obviously a difference in the um, conditions within the house. Generally, most people will be comfortable in humidity between 30 to 80% if your air temperature is in the range from 18 to 24. Okay, so that's uh, that's one view in one country, and if we shoot across the to the states, um, uh, there's a uh, down the bottom there. I've got your flag for for that. Um, uh, it's interesting. The the source of that graph is from ASHRAE, which is um, the American um, uh, heating and ventilation type society, and they put a lot, of, a lot of technical stuff. And if you look at the axis on the graph, the left hand side it says dissatisfied. And dissatisfaction or dissatisfied and so it's looking at what temperature people will be least dissatisfied in and it works out to be somewhere around about 23 degrees C so I don't know the states is a big place Australia is a big place but they're saying hey the comfortable temperature is 23 degrees C and often in Australia when we've got cooling systems going they're saying oh I'll cool down to 24 degrees C that's a good balance on, on things. Um, so in the states 23 degrees C is the sweet spot and they also say 30 to 50 percent relative humidity. So again, we see uh, quite a difference there, um, in that uh, um, quite quite a difference between the two countries. Where New Zealand's accepting that that humidities are going to be higher in the house, and of course, higher humidities don't tend to dry out floors as much. Um, in the states, uh, even like when you've got snow in the states, it's actually a, quite a dry external environment, creating a dry internal environment, and we'll look at that soon. Okay, now on to Australia, and again, this isn't from a, uh, a flooring site, and it says much of Australia's population lives in areas where the outdoor humidity is moderate to high. Okay, so they're linking into the you know, tropical type weather, but even places like Sydney, yes, we get quite high humidity there. But indoor climate control may make indoor environments dry. Oh, acknowledgement that heating can dry things out. For most Australians who live in urban areas not far from the coast, there may be relatively few days in the year where the indoor air is below 30% relative humidity. Um, okay, we often get those uh, dry days, particularly in the afternoon, even in Brisbane. Uh, certainly areas like uh, Adelaide can have very, very dry weather. High levels of indoor humidity are likely to be more prevalent for Australians with dust mites, allergens, 
being the key trigger for asthma and allergies. So interestingly enough there, um, you see this in, in their graph, this ideal range uh, for, um, uh, for conditions in Australia. And again, if you look at the left-hand side graph, it's got temperature there. And what do you know, that's probably sitting an average of around about 22, 23%. And if we're looking at the average for the relative humidity, probably just a little bit under 50%, but still so saying our oh, ideal range up to a little bit over 60%. So um, you can see things are a little bit different from country to country. And of course our flooring gets made differently in, in, uh, depending on its, uh, where its market it's going to. And often it's being made for either the States or Europe. And I think the States in Europe, the, in Europe they might have a temperature that's a little bit lower, but certainly um, drier internal conditions is 30 to 50 percent. So that's a little bit of an understanding of uh, internal climates, what's going to be reasonable for people and, and really if you look at those, if, you, if you've got a floors, you know, sitting ground uh, say 50 percent humidity and 23 degrees C, that's a pretty pleasant sort of uh, uh, conditions inside a house, not too hot, not too cold and not too humid. Okay, so now comes time to consider our timber floors. Now, um, I'm providing these two diagrams here for, really for conceptual type reasons. So um, sometimes it's a little bit hard to get a little bit of information on, on some things. I think we could do a little bit of re more research on in some areas. But if we um, look at the graph on the left hand side, the concept I want to get across here is um, we've got along the bottom axis, we've got temperature, 30 to 100 degrees C, so this is a bit side outside our range, although some timber floors and the sun and with uh, heat on them can get up to uh, 50 odd degrees C. But uh, the, uh, the axis on the left hand side uh, relates to the drying rate. So what the graph is saying is that the higher the temperature, the greater the drying rate. So therefore, if we had the same humidity in a room and or two rooms with the same humidity and that humidity might be say 40 percent but one room was at five degrees c and the other was at 30 degrees c then the water is going to come out of the wood where the temperature is 30 degrees c much faster than if the room is at five degrees c so this is the effect of temperature on uh, moisture movement in wood. The higher the temperature, the quicker moisture will go in and out of wood. And of course, if we've got radiant heating, um, which is uh, directly uh, raising the temperature of the wood, well, the wood's going to say, hey, I can I can get rid of this moisture real easily. What's the humidity? Okay, that's low. Okay, I'll give my moisture to the air. So that's one principle that we need to be aware of. The other principle is that water doesn't go out of all surfaces of the wood equally. And what you find is that, as in the diagram on the right there, looking at the end grain, we get water coming out of the end grain much more quickly than we do out of what we call either the back sawn or the quarter sawn face. And again, it's quicker out of the uh, back sawn face than it is out of the corner, quarter sawn face. So therefore, ends of boards are more susceptible to uh, moisture loss. And of course, if we've got um, uh, uh, in-floor heating vents and we've got end grain going up to them and the board ends get um, uh, hot, then we've also got conditions where the uh, moisture want to go out of the ends of the boards quickly and you're going to get greater shrinkage and maybe some uh, splits in the boards as a result of that. Okay. Um, the EMC, what do we mean by EMC? Now a lot of you may uh, have heard me plenty of times talking about EMC and what it is, but uh, let's have a refresher on that. EMC stands for the Equilibrium Moisture Content, and it's the moisture content that timber will approach under set conditions of humidity and temperature. So if we've got 20 degrees C, and we've got 60% relative humidity, then irrespective of what the moisture content of a, a board might be, it's going to try and head towards 11% moisture content. If the temperature is high compared to the temperature being low, it's going to head to that um, 
uh, that uh, uh, that EMC a lot lot more quickly. Um, so uh, we'll and we'll have a look at that a little bit soon too. Now we've got this graph, this EMC graph, and it's quite an interesting one I think, and, and quite relevant to us because it now starts looking at what are the conditions outside a house compared to inside a house, and um, what the graph is saying that if I bring my cursor over here and say, oh, this is the EMC of 14%. And what it's saying is that um, if I was to raise the temperature inside the dwelling by 12 degrees C, what's that going to do? Well, that's a point there. What it's going to do, it's going to change the EMC inside the dwelling uh, to bring it down from 14% down to 7%. So just have a look at that again. We've got um, an EMC, external EMC of 14%, so around 75% humidity outside at whatever temperature. And if through heating we raise the temperature inside the house, so if it's, um, you know, um, uh, 10 degrees outside and we raise the temperature up to 22 degrees C then it's going to drop the EMC from 14% outside down to about 7% inside. So therefore we need to think for certain internal uh, temperatures the, the colder it is outside the greater the degrees above ambient and the lower the internal EMC. So therefore, the more you have to heat your house, the more temperature difference you're wanting between um, inside your house to outside of the house, the drier the conditions are going to be inside your house. Okay, now I've lost my cursor. There it is. Um, and uh, when we come on to, um, uh, sometimes I've spoken to you, I think, about absolute and relative humidity. Um, and again, this is a, another way of, uh, of looking at it. So um, in various courses, I, I run this graph to, to talk about various things and we can uh, adapt it to, to talk about things here. So if we're not adding any water to the air inside our house, now remember that gas heater added water into the house. So let's forget about that one. But if we've got all our doors closed and we've got, you know, um, uh, good insulation and those sorts of things. And all we do is use a heater to raise the temperature. This is another graph which talks about what happens to the relative humidity inside the house. So before we're talking about EMC, and you can work out the EMC from temperature and humidity. And so that's another way of looking at it. So what this is saying here, if the outs, if it was outside was seven degrees C and 80% relative humidity and I don't add water to the air and I don't take water out of the air. It means that I've got this much water, absolute humidity in the air. And if I was to raise the temperature from seven degrees C up to 20 degrees C, then, and not adding any water to the air, then we've got to follow this blue line down to where it intersects that, that curve through there. And what that does, it brings the internal humidity down to, to 30, 37%. So you can have conditions that are really quite wet and quite um, cold outside, and you bring the internal temperature up to something that's quite reasonable. And you, obviously you don't want to open doors for all the cold air to come in and that sort of thing. And so therefore our heating systems can create these really quite dry internal conditions in this case that 13 degrees C rise in temperature ended up in 37% relative humidity. But we also need to remember that um, you know where's this temperature? Is it um, 20 degrees C at this side, at this side or this side? And of course as far as floors are concerned we're interested in the floor temperature down here. Okay, so on one of our information sheets, we've got this little graph here, which I think is a good thing to you can use to talk to to owners about. And so we've got heating down here when heaters are used inside. Wow, well, the temperature is going to go up, and when the temperature goes up, as we saw, the relative humidity goes down. 
So as the temperature rises, the relative humidity decreases, there's less moisture in the air, the air becomes dry, moisture is uh, naturally released uh, from the timber to try and equalise it. But the result is that timber will shrink and it will tend to gap at board edges if it's uh, solid flooring. Um, so when it comes to aspects to be considered with heating, uh, firstly, raising the temperature increases the drying rate. Higher room temperature makes the internal environment drier. So what moisture content could the flooring uh, approach? Well, this is what we have this uh, table here. It's in a lot of our publications and that sort of thing. Um, and again, this is this EMC type table. So I said 20 degrees C, 60% relative humidity is 11% moisture content. And uh, we saw that around about 35% relative humidity at 20 degrees C is about 7% moisture content. So maintaining 40% relative humidity with a floor temperature of 30 degrees C will cause board moisture content to approach about 7.5%. So I think you're getting the, the or hopefully getting the picture that hey, um, playing around with uh, heating in our internal climate can cause quite dry conditions. So as we've been through quite a lot so far, let's just go through uh, some of the main concepts that we've uh, we've been talking about. Internal heating ca can provide radiant, convective, and conductive heating, or often uh, a combination of these uh, of these uh, heating uh, types of heating. Um, temperature causes the drying rate to increase. That's the drying rate of the timber, our timber floors to increase, and for the air to become drier. A rise in temperature causes a drop in relative humidity. Comfortable internal conditions differ a little between countries and locations. What we might find is the comfortable um, internal conditions in winter in, in Queensland is going to be quite different to that in Invercargill. Um, different heating systems create different temperature profiles in a room. So we need to be aware that, um, well, you know, that uh, some heating systems are going to cause floors to one floor to react differently to another. Unflued gas heating systems add moisture to the air, but um, uh, as I say, these, uh, there's a little bit of controversy about those and they may not be uh, uh, used all that much longer. Um, the drier the air, the lower the moisture content and the greater the shrinkage. So again, we've got this, this graph and this is also very good to talk to clients about and and uh, say, well, you know, look, if I've got a, a floorboard and look at these things, 60% relative humidity, 20 degrees C is 11% moisture content. But hey, look, if we've got put dry conditions from our heating system in there, what it's going to do is going to bring it to um, say 40% relative humidity, the moisture content's going to be eight, and look what's going to happen to the width of our boards, they're going to shrink. But of course, if the humidity goes back up again in other times of the year, well, we'll get recovery of those boards and those shrinkage gaps will reduce. Okay, um, so, as I indicated, when we're starting to look at colder type climates, we also need to be aware that there are a sort of two different types of um, uh, colder type climates. And um, if we look at Melbourne for argument's sake, um, and compare that to say Christchurch in New Zealand, the heating period, uh, just look at those graphs. Here we've got relative humidity here. Um, and we've got temperature down here. So just comparing these, these two, two places, uh, you can see here that the humidity swing in Melbourne is greater than it is in Christchurch, but Christchurch is still up there similarly in winter as far as its humidities go, but not as dry in summer. And similarly, you look at temperatures. The temperature graph through here starts at 30 over here and ducks down. And here it starts at um, around about 25 degrees C and ducks down. So we've already got a five degree uh, C difference in temperature and summer temperature there. That goes down to, uh, what is it, about 10 degrees C. And this is going down to about seven or eight degrees C. So you can see there are some similarities and some differences. But one of the biggest differences is that if we go to a place like Melbourne, 
um, we have a hot, dry summer. Um, whereas, and because of the higher temperatures that we naturally have, we will also have a, a shorter heating period than we will in a place like Christchurch. And um, uh, and so we could say that Christchurch, well, it's got a moderate sort of a summer and will generally have longer heating periods. And as I said, when, I, uh, when we lived uh, in Rotorua, um, we used to put the fire, tile fire on for maybe five months of the year. It wouldn't be maybe going uh, all the time, but we'd probably try to keep it ticking over overnight so we could light, light um, let it flare up again in the morning and things like that. So quite a long heating period. Um, yeah, and I like, oh, should I save it here in, in, uh, in Brisbane? Well, we we might put the uh, some sort of heating on a couple of days a year. Uh, so quite different. So. Um, the, the graph here is, is uh, on the right hand side is really a theoretical type graph of, of looking at both the external outside conditions and the internal conditions. And it's a theoretical thing, it was done as part of a research project many years ago. And uh, so what it's saying is the EMC, the, the moisture content that timber will try and attain under set conditions of relative humidity and temperature. And this is the months of the year going across here. And this is looking down in Tasmania uh, where it's coolish, coldish and saying, well, if we don't have any heating type system, the, the external, uh, you know, the EMCs like this or the EMCs like this. And then as soon as we, the outside, it's getting colder and the humidity is going up outside because we put on our heating systems, we're dropping our humidity and we're causing an EMC of around about uh, 8% and then it comes back up again. So if we were looking at the, the average moisture content of our flooring uh, in a heated type of environment, we see it's, it's relatively uh, low. It's probably around, you know, often around 10% and can go down to 8% and maybe not much up over 12%. Whereas in somewhere like, like Brisbane, we don't have this, um, although we have our dry time in winter, we're always sitting uh, at, at, at higher levels. So that's how climates can compare in different places. Now when it comes to product moisture contents and movement, if we look at solid timber flooring, and really here I just want to compare solid timber flooring with engineered flooring. So AS2796, the manufacturing standard says thou shalt um, uh, manufacture your solid timber flooring between 9% and 14% uh, moisture content. Although really most floors that are going down are probably sitting on an average between somewhere between 9 and 12%. Um, and with most boards sitting between 9 and 12%. We do have uh, flooring that comes from the states, um, oak and maple. And um, uh, they manufacture their flooring at around six to nine percent moisture content. And just to prove that this is the case, here's a maple floor in Brisbane. And uh, you've got these, when you've got maple sports floors, they're little wee short boards a lot of the time. They only go up to about you know, maybe 1.8 metres in length is the longest. And they can be something like 230 millimetres long is the shortest. And they put these into packs and and of course the end grain, remember I talk about the end grain, how moisture goes into the end grain a lot quicker or comes out a lot quicker. And in this case here, where it's been covered up, the actual moisture contents are uh, six and seven and seven and a half, but where the moisture's been able to get into the end grain, oh, nine, nine and a half, nine and a half. So let's think on this, you know, if we've got our solid timber flooring that's been manufactured nine to 12%, let's say an average of and a half percent, then yes, when it goes into the drier type conditions, it's going to uh, going to tend to shrink. So if it's over um, uh, subfloor heating, underfloor heating type system, then with solid timber flooring, you can expect some shrinkage unless you can try and get that moisture content down a little bit lower. Subfloor heating systems like to be maintaining uh, moisture content of the timber above them at around about nine percent all year round. Um, uh, so there are these differences and you might say, well, you know, this is this is great. We can have, um, you know, if we had some of this stuff coming in, well, it's already lower our moisture content. We're not going to have so much movement, but you've got to watch out for expansion. Now, um, just as an aside, um, oh, maybe we'll talk about it a little bit later on. Let's go on to the engineer. Um, so 
What most conduct does the engineered flooring get manufactured to? Wow, look at this. This is the European norm, the European standard for engineered flooring. It talks about moisture content between 5% and 9%. Wow, that's slow, isn't it? Um, and even, you know, sometimes I do oven dry testing for um, a product coming out of China and it's often between 9 and 10%. So we can hear there's, like, there's one, two, three, four, five, six samples. And uh, these samples were around about 10%. These samples were around around about 9%. So generally, you can think that engineered flooring is always going to be lower in moisture content than solid timber flooring. And of course, this then makes it, um, uh, you know, better for um, uh, uh, for laying over um, subfloor heating systems, and also where um, where there is heating. Uh, it can be a little bit more more stable than its solid counterpart. So, where does that take us? Okay, let's have a look at timber floors and underfloor heating. So, as I said before, and it's on the front page there, you can look it up. App has got an information sheet specific to this, and some points I suppose from it to consider are: that solid timber flooring can be used, but generally we want 19 millimeter flooring for stability reasons. Uh, but with, uh, it will have um, seasonal movement and gapping. Uh, and it, again, it's been manufactured at a higher moisture content, so again, that's why we can expect it to gap um, unless we've been able to bring the moisture content down further. But even so, if have a look at that photo there. Here's a, here's a heated solid uh, black butt floor after a year in service and performing quite well. You can see the top parting, so it's probably on, on battens, I would think. Now, engineering flooring is manufactured at a lower moisture content, as we've said, closer to the heated internal EMC. So that makes it um, quite a good choice for internal um, uh, subfloor heating systems. Engineered flooring is thinner than solid on plywood because generally we would put our solid timber flooring on top of plywood and therefore has better heat transfer. So we've got to think our wood is actually a good insulator. Um, because of the little air tubes inside, it will tend to try and insulate. So the thinner we can make our wood, uh, the better it is. But also with solid timber flooring, if you make it too thin, then you start losing stability of the board. And it uh, seasonally will try to uh, move around a lot. So 12 millimetre is not necessarily a good thickness for solid timber flooring. And not all species or products in engineered are recommended for installation over heated subfloors, and we've had a had a uh, um, we've spoken about that earlier. So you've got to check the product. Now this is a bit I was going to get to before, and realised I should be I'll wait till now. Climates such as Sydney are not well suited to underfloor heating, as Sydney has warm, humid summers, not like Melbourne and Adelaide. So we saw that in Melbourne we've got hot, dry summers, which keeps the EMC down, and with heating in the winter, the EMC is also down. That is not the case for Sydney, and not, um, Perth's a little bit in between there, but certainly not the case for Sydney. And so sometimes when people ring me up and say, "Oh, Dave, uh, I've got a job with um, underfloor heating in Sydney," and I sort of reply to them saying, "Well," Is that really a wise thing to do? And uh, because climatic wise, um, I don't think it is a particularly wise thing to do. So something that you might need to consider with that. And certainly um, with solid timber flooring, you're likely to have um, higher risk of uh, problems uh, in that type of an environment. So warm, humid summers are not good for places with underfloor heating. And really Sydney doesn't get that cold either. And uh, of course, in the USA, they're really saying with subfloor heating that the upper, the upper seasonal relative humidity limit is 50%. And of course, in Sydney and Brisbane, we get, in summer we get 65, 70% relative humidity inside quite often. Um, now, in the USA, um, it's interesting that it seems to be more creeping in that this supplementary humidification is becoming more common so that the floors don't end up becoming too dry. Um, humidifiers and things are being introduced uh, um, in the States. Um, now, interestingly enough, they've also uh, 
introducing or suggesting that people should be using data loggers as well in both the floor and to assist owners to maintain appropriate conditions. So the data loggers are measuring humidity and temperature and so it's giving, uh, if there's a display giving um, uh, the uh, humidity, it means the owners can keep an eye on that. If it's been data log, then you can see what conditions the floor is uh, being put under. So it becomes a management tool. Okay, product response under hot dry conditions. Oh, here's a here's a few things, isn't it? So I had a you know the main flooring types of uh, solid and engineered uh, laminate can cope with uh, a bit more than these others. Um, and uh, uh, bamboo is going to move around a lot as well. Uh, but for solid timber flooring, again, um, quite often we see in front of fireplaces, if it's being used a lot, then, hey, look, we're getting lots of gapping at board edges here. And look at this across here with maybe a little bit of edge bonding and that sort of thing. We can get quite wide gaps um, happening in our floor from uh, this type of heating system. And again here, in this case you've got a, um, a gas type heater, you'll see the gas pipe coming through here, and, and uh, it seems to be this one is blowing air out across the bottom of the, uh, through here across the floor, and wow, look at these, these wide gaps that are happening through here. So again, design of equipment can be also a factor, and obviously uh, you want to really suck in the bottom and uh, blow out the top. Uh, to maintain cooler conditions over your floor. Now, when it comes to engineered, uh, they can also have their, their problems in very dry climates. We often see with engineered flooring, they say, well, hey, between 35 and 60% relative humidity is the, the optimum thing. And when we create dry conditions across the top of the floor, um, it's putting greater stress on the glue bond underneath the lamella. If that glue bond's not particularly good, then we can have situations where we're getting the lamella lifting off the, um, uh, off the, off the base layer beneath, or you could even get splitting of the base layer as well. Um, as a result of that, you can get the boards slightly curling up a little bit and you can end up with some uh, lipping at board edges. But one of the main uh, main issues not happening in all boards because of the, the nature of the grain angle and, and initial moisture contents, but a lot more surface checking can occur in boards, particularly close to the fire. So in this dwelling here, Oh, I don't know, there might have been 20, 30 boards with quite significant checking in it. You go into the bedrooms and there's none of this happening whatsoever. So we do need to be careful. Um, but, you know, we've also got to consider that with moderate use, um, uh, you know, people can expect to have you know, a comfortable internal environment and all heating systems can work with timber floors. And so, you know, here we've got a situation where we've got a fireplace here. Oh, we get a lot of sun exposure on here. This has oak floor. This one's uh, in New Zealand. And uh, yes, there's a little bit of gapping around here, around boards, but nothing serious. The owners are quite happy. The owners are understanding of it. And of course, a decent, decent hearth around it. They've got a floor rug here, and maybe when the fire's on, they might want to bring that up close to here to again protect the flooring from the radiant heat directly coming out from it. So again, a lot of it's talking to clients and having them understand both the heating system and the floor that's in. Um, here we've got a uh, ducted heating system, underfloor ducted seating system through a engineered oak floor and things seem to be performing there quite happily. And similarly, here we have a wall radiator um, and it to yeah, providing gentle heat out, but the airflow will be going past it and lifting that warm air up towards the ceiling. And in that case there, the floor was performing quite well also. Okay, now sometimes when we have problems with, with floors, um, the immediate thing, especially when there's a heating system or whatever, oh, there's a problem with the floor, it must be a problem with the heating system. And I want to throw a slide in here that says, don't blame just the heating system when other factors can contribute. And so um, things to think about, particularly if you're going selling floors that are going into spaces where you know that they're going to be heated, you know there's going to be, for instance, underfloor heating, um, you know, consider the species in engineered flooring, knowing that the higher density species 
are going to be more prone to some problems um, uh, experienced with, with engineered flooring. Things like uh, surface checking is going to be uh, more prominent in, in, thing, in species like spotted gum, as we saw in that photo, compared to uh, maybe oak. Um, Consider the climate and the amount of heating that will be needed. Remember, the greater the temperature difference between outside and inside, the greater the heating, the drier the internal climate. Uh, flooring manufactured too, uh, too high in moisture content will be more prone to problems. Bore construction can also contri contribute, as I say, splitting of the plywood layer. Um, and if you look over here, um, you know, this, this floor had, um, uh, some underfloor heating, not under the timber flooring, but under uh, tiles to the bathroom. And at one stage it was being blamed, the underfloor heating was being blamed for the condition of the timber floor. But when we took samples out of this floor, you can see there's a huge amount of shrinkage um, in an engineered board here. And the lamella is still sitting up at 13.4%. Well, that's, we don't expect you know, this flooring will be manufactured at moisture contents that high. So in this case, we've got shrinkage, we've got cupping, and we've got uh, checking uh, in the boards, which obviously you can see the shrinkage gap there too, uh, attributed to board manufacture rather than the heating system. A cold, low humidity climate will be more prone to problems than a cold, high humidity uh, climate. Um, the aspect of the house and sun exposure in conjunction with the heating can have a greater effect on the floor. So, you know, if you've got um, a cold climate that's uh, naturally low in humidity, well, it's low in humidity, and so therefore temperature difference again, it's going to be even lower in humidity uh, internally. Uh, and then if you've got sun exposure on the floor because we haven't got any ease and that sort of thing, well, you've got a combination of factors there that are also going to affect the floor. So it's not just the heating system that's doing it, it's partly the design of the house and also the location. And if we're smart, we would get those things worked out before the floor went in. Okay, so finally I want to um, just talk about maintaining a consistent, consistent internal environment because that's really, really the key. Um, in cold climates, generally all dwellings have heating of some sort, and our timber floors need to uh, cater for moderate use of that heating system. Owners need to be informed and encouraged to maintain moderate internal conditions and the effects uh, of direct um, heat type sources. For as little as $50, a temperature and humidity data logger, as in the picture there, uh, can be purchased, enabling owners to understand their internal climate and provide um, a long-term record. Um, and I think we need to realise, um, even though I'm uh, starting to age slightly, um, we do live in times where lots of people have dash cams or um, there's electrical smart metering of, uh, of things. Um, and, and so, you know, asking someone or encouraging someone to spend 50 bucks on a temperature and humidity data logger is really not out of the, the norm for our expectations today and the technology that we have today to try and assist us with things. Um, some of the old age remedies of things and things that people can try and and to a degree work, it's like, but again, it's it's not, oh, well, I've, I've got a kettle on my, um, my uh, my uh, wood-fired heater, so therefore I can crank the wood-fired heater up to its max. Well, no, uh, moderate use and use of a kettle to add some humidity back in the air, yes, it's a good idea. Having pot plants um, in the house is a good idea. There's two things there. Uh, the water in the pot plant will evaporate, plants give off moisture, but also if things are too hot, the plant's going to wilt and start dying and telling you that, hey, I need to do something about that. On the market, there's an increasing number of humidifiers, often for health type reasons, but sometimes in where the floors have been very dry in summer and they're being laid, sometimes we've used um, uh, humidifiers and uh, uh, evaporative coolers to add moisture into the air. And even this one on the right here, this is overseas, but even uh, they've found that just a bowl of water and that sort of thing in, in front of these places can also, uh, they can notice the water evaporating out of the bowl and adding humidity in the air. 
but really, you know, it's really a case of sensible use and some of these other things might help along the way. But certainly the owner having a bit of an understanding of how dry conditions can get and that hot conditions are going to make the floor react uh, more intensely. Uh, and they need to have, uh, you know, they've got some responsibility themselves of maintaining that internal climate. Okay, so well, there you have it. Um, uh, and again, uh, I'd just like to thank Regupol for their support of this webinar. And uh, Josh, I don't know whether we've got any questions or not. Oh, thanks, Dave. That was a fantastic webinar. Um, yeah, if anyone wants to ask any questions, now's the time. Um, at this stage, we haven't got any, Dave. So everyone's understood, I think, pretty pretty thoroughly. So I'll just... Um, go yeah, well, they can always email me, but uh, I suppose it's fairly self-explanatory. And yeah. just sometimes I think we just been reminding that our communication with clients is, is paramount in a, in, a, in a lot of these things. Now, sometimes that can be difficult, uh, especially if, um, you know, Tim has been sold on and sold to someone else and then sold to, to a client. But we've all got a responsibility down the chain to to uh, make sure that things work and work sensibly and and that uh, owners are well aware of um, what they need to do. Exactly right. So, Dave. yes. Thank you very much, Dave, as always, for your expert advice and knowledge for today's webinar. Guys, there will be a, a webinar recording of today's put up on the um, ATFA website tomorrow. So if you know someone who missed it or you'd like to relive it again or maybe use it for training of your staff, it should be up by Close the Business tomorrow. You'll just need your website access codes to, to rewatch it. Also, I'd like to thank again our webinar sponsor for today, uh, Regipol. So for more information, please go to their website, which is regipol.com.au. All right, guys, our next webinar for the year is on the 6th of August, and the topic will be on coating adhesion and hardness testing. Um, registrations are now open on the ATFA website for that webinar, so that will be a fantastic one. So please put it in the diary the 6th of August. So for all our up-and-coming events, guys, please keep a lookout on our, on our website and our social media pages, which is Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, which are all fantastic ATFA information outlets. So if anyone has any questions regarding today's webinar or any of the up-and-coming events that we spoke about earlier in tonight, please send me an email, josh, J-O-S-H, at atfa.com.au. Or if it's technical and regarding this webinar, please send it through to david at d-a-v-i-d at atfa.com.au. Okay, guys, I'd like to thank you all very much for listening to today's webinar. From Dave and myself, have a great afternoon or evening, depending on where you're listening from in Australasia. And we look forward to talking to you all again on the 6th of August. Goodbye for now.